welcome everyone uh, to the session, uh, Scaling Database Workloads with Azure SQL Hyperscale. If you have seen the uh, published um, uh, list of sessions in the, in the website or something, you may have seen that the speaker is supposed to be uh, Denzil Rivero. Uh, we are from the same team and Denzil is not uh, feeling well. So Dimitri and I will we have stepped in to walk you through the session. We are from the same team, so you are getting the same content. Uh, just different speakers. So thank you for 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 bearing with us uh, for this uh, little bit of change. Uh, <clears throat> today is 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 a great day to talk about Azure SQL Hyperscale. Uh, we have so many success stories with Azure SQL Hyperscale. Uh, in fact, Azure SQL Hyperscale is um, is the best thing that has happened since SQL Server itself. Uh, SQL Server, as uh, most of you know, uh, has been an extremely successful uh, relational database engine used in on-premises, used in other clouds, used in Azure Cloud in various form factors, and runs some of the most important workloads among big, small Fortune 500 startups, ISVs in, in, in all over the world. And the best thing to happen since then in the database world is actually the advent of Azure SQL Hyperscale. Azure SQL Hyperscale is nothing but the same SQL server at the front that you are familiar with, but a very differently architected behind the scene to ensure that you take advantage of cloud constructs to the cloud building blocks to make them, make it much more scalable, uh, much more um, uh, adaptable and much more elastic uh, to the cloud workload demands. And this is available in the cloud and um, and therefore, it's so important to know the architecture of, of hyperscale database because behind the scene it is very different from the SQL server that you're familiar with. In front, from your application point of view, it's exactly the same, nothing changes. Uh, we'll also talk about any uh, recent feature improvements, what has come through. Uh, we'll also talk about what is coming in near near future. Uh, we'll show you tons of demos about on performance, on scaling tips, and we'll also talk to you about who is using Hyperscale today and how they're using and why they're, they're using, what kind of benefits they're getting out of Hyperscale today. Uh, as I mentioned to you, uh, Hyperscale is uh, uh, nothing but SQL from the front point of view, front end point of view, from the relational capabilities point of view. It's the same database engine that you're familiar with. It has uh, all the great capabilities like the intelligent query processing, column store, graph, JSON, spatial, anything that you know and, 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 and use today. And you use them the same way that you use in SQL Server or Azure SQL TB, et cetera. Um, what we have done uh, behind the scene is that we have re-architected to take advantage of uh, cloud uh, design patterns. We have separated storage and compute uh, so that you can scale them independently uh, that allows us to give you much, much bigger databases allows you to scale the compute up and down much faster as and when you need and independent of scaling the storage. And that, those are huge advantages in, 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 in the cloud. And, um, um, and then how, how it, it applies to uh, various workloads and how, how you can scale. Uh, those are the few things that, that we need to be familiar with as we talk about hyperscale. Uh, I'll hand over to my colleague, Dimitri, who can walk you through each layers of the architecture and then go deeper uh, in this space. I encourage everybody to put your questions on the, on the chat window as deep as you want to go. This is from the team who built Hyperscale. So go as deep as you want to, uh, want to know about it. Go as deep as you want to know about customer usage patterns. Go as deep as you go in your questions in terms of scaling tips, performance tips, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, over to you, Dimitri. Thanks, Sanjay, and welcome everyone. So let me start sharing. All right, so uh, we'll start this talk by going over hyperscale architecture uh, just at a very high level. Uh, so uh, we've talked about separation of compute and storage. So what does it really mean? Uh, if you start looking at the picture on the right, uh, let's kind of start uh, uh, taking this apart uh, from the top. Like, so we have this uh, primary replica, uh, so the letter P, 
on the left. Uh, and that just runs uh, the traditional uh, compute engine, uh, SQL Server compute, uh, compute engine that, that you are familiar with. Uh, and the same actually goes for all of those other replicas, compute replicas we have on the right, HA replicas, named replicas, and we'll go uh, over what named replicas are, uh, what HA replicas are. So this is basically just trans traditional SQL Server. So if you if you think about SQL Server um, as a layered cake, right? So you have a query processing at the top, connectivity at the top, then transaction processing, and then at the very bottom, you have a layer, a storage engine layer. So what we've done basically, we've replaced that bottom layer of the cake with a distributed and scaled out storage engine. So today we'll, we'll actually spend most of our time talking about that bottom layer. So uh, there is a primary replica, there are other compute replicas, and then uh, below that we have page servers. So uh, each page server hosts a part of the database, a data file, as it were. Uh, it has two replicas. Uh, we'll go deeper into uh, the architecture of page servers next. Uh, but basically, as the database grows, we keep adding page servers. Some of the larger databases we have have hundreds of page servers. So this is the scale out. Basically, we, we are not really limited uh, in, in the database size uh, because we can simply keep adding uh, page servers. Now. If you look below page servers at this bottom layer, so uh, that's actually Azure storage. That's where data is actually stored. Uh, page servers have a copy of the data cached, but the actual database data is stored in Azure standard storage blobs. Uh, you will see that there are two of them uh, for each page server because page server has two replicas and each replica has, has its own blob, right? So again, this grows dynamically. Uh, Azure storage is virtually limitless. Uh, so we can keep adding uh, new blobs as the database grows. Now, on the right, you see log service. Log service is something that kind of ties it all together. Uh, so any, any change that you make to the database first makes it to the log service, and then log service is responsible for applying that change to page servers, other replicas, and so on and so forth. So uh, we'll dive deeper into all of this. Uh, this is just a high-level picture. So what else? Uh, so as you add HA replicas, you get higher SLAs. So uh, HA replicas serve as hot failover targets. So if the primary fails for any reason, uh, there is a very short, uh, typically less than 10 seconds failover to one of the HA replicas. Now, uh, even if you don't add any HA replicas because you can set them to zero, that doesn't mean that your database is not highly available. It still is. It's just the failover takes longer. Instead of a few seconds, it may take maybe up to a minute. Um, these named replicas, you can add up to 30 of them and we'll spend uh, a good amount of time talking about what named replicas are and the capabilities they provide. Um, as far as backup restore, that's actually not done in the engine at all. It's done at the storage level. Uh, so there is no impact from backup on, on the compute performance. So that's unlike any other SQL engine you, you might have seen and that's a hyperscale uh, unique uh, thing. And then all of this uh, can be geo-replicated to another region. And then uh, transaction log that's generated by the primary in one region is streamed uh, to the same architecture in another region to provide geo-replication capabilities. All right, so next, let's just see how, how this looks in the portal. So let me open the portal. This is a hyperscale database, wide world importers, the standard sample database on hyperscale. Okay, so, and it's actually not very different uh, from any other Azure SQL database as far as the portal goes. So you can see uh, the compute utilization metrics, you can see space uh, allocated and space used. And then if you go to compute and storage, uh, we can see what, how, how you can uh, change some parameters of the database. Okay, so you see the hardware configuration box, uh, you can switch hardware from Gen 5 to something else. Uh, you can see the number of the cores currently it's set to two cores. I can scale it all the way up to 80 or whatever the hardware generation provides or will provide. Um, so you can also set the number of high availability replicas here. Right now this database has zero and I can slide it all the way to the right to have four. Now, one thing that you don't see here and you would see on the other, on other, other Azure SQL databases is the slider that lets you set the maximum database size. So in hyperscale, you don't have to set the maximum database size because it's virtually limitless. It's 100 terabytes. So you, you don't even manage that at all. The database grows as needed, okay? Uh, so we talked about uh, uh, replicas in hyperscale. So let's look at the replica screen because this is also uh, hyperscale specific. So we see that uh, there is a primary here in this section. It's in Southeast Asia, it has two cores. 
uh, it's on this uh, DevDemo 02 server. Then we have a geo replica of this database. It's in East US, uh, so different server, different region, it also has two ports, although you can scale it up or down as needed. And then you have two named replicas. Named replicas must be in the same region as the primary, and in this case, they're actually on two different servers. Uh, one is the same server as the primary, and the other end on the different server. And they can also have different uh, number of ports. So um, that's, again, we'll spend more time talking about named replicas, but just, this is just a quick glance. All right, next, um, let's go and do another demo. Let's see how we can scale up in hyperscale. So in this case, uh, what I have here is a tool called SQL Query Stress. It's a, it's a popular tool. You might have seen it in other conference demos. And what it does, it basically lets you um, generate a, a workload against the database by running the same query in a loop on multiple threads, multiple connections. So in this case, I'm running 10,000 iterations. I'm running a stored procedure, which is just generating some uh, high CPU utilization. right? So, and I'm repeating on, on 10 threads. So you can see various uh, readouts here. And uh, the one that's kind of I'd like you to pay attention to is this iterations completed. This number is increasing, which means that the workload is running. And then you have this total exceptions box and it's zero right now. So everything is working as it's supposed to work. Okay, so let's take a closer look at this database. So this database, is not small. It's allocated size is 160 gigabytes. It's used size a little bit less than that. It has four page servers. So if this was uh, a business critical database and scaling this to a higher number of cores would probably take about an hour, right? So let's see how long it takes on hyperscale. First, let's check resource utilization. So here we see that after I started running this workload, my CPU is actually packed at pretty much 100%. Right, so, and it's uh, pretty clear that with two cores, uh, it's just not enough uh, resources to run this workload. We see it's a two-core database. So let's go ahead and uh, actually scale it up uh, to four cores. Okay, so I do it. I do it from T-SQL. You can also do it from the portal, right? Or you can do it from PowerShell. You can do it from Azure CLI. There are multiple ways. So this command runs asynchronously, so it completes quickly. But the, the actual process of scaling is now continuing in the background. And we can actually see if we look at another query that you run in the master database. But this is in progress, okay? So it's not yet done. And let's now, as it's happening, let's look at, um, at our application. So you can see this is continuing to run. We, we don't have any downtime, even though uh, the scaling is in progress. So it's still on the older service objective to course. And at some point in the next few seconds, uh, you will see that uh, this number is actually going to freeze right, right here. So this is frozen. At this point, we, there is actually a short period of downtime, about 10 to 15 seconds, when we, we are scaling and switching the service objective to more cores. You can also see some exceptions, because uh, the application is trying to talk to the database, but it can't. There is currently downtime. So, but this application has retry logic built in. So it's actually not, it's, it's recording the exceptions, but it's there. They're not affecting. Uh, the actual functionality. So you can see that this has resumed. Okay, so um, at this point, uh, the database is back online and it's running on the four ports. So we can uh, go back <clears throat> to SSMS, check service objectives again. It's four cores. And we can also see uh, what, how resource utilization looks. So you can see it's, it's only at 74%. So uh, the extra CPU clearly help. help. Okay, let's get back to slides. Okay, so <clears throat> let's take a somewhat closer look at uh, hyperscale architecture. And our next topic will be uh, inside of a page server. So what is a page server? So it says stateful service fabric service with replication factor two. What does it mean? So you might know this, but Azure SQL in general, not just hyperscale runs on top of service fabric. And service fabric is an infrastructure platform uh, that provides uh, high availability, uh, management, <clears throat> uh, redundancy, load balancing, and all of those things that, uh, that you need to run a distributed uh, service in the cloud. Um, so a page server is just an application on top of service fabric and replication factor two simply means that there are two of them. There are two replicas for a page server. 
on different nodes. And that's uh, for availability reasons uh, and for performance reasons, because it's actually work as an active-active pair. So each one of those replicas has its own file in Azure Blob Storage. And compute replica uh, maintains quality of service so that it knows which uh, replica of the page server uh, is performing better at any given point in time. And, and, and it can switch back and forth between the two. <clears throat> and the page server actually runs SQL Server. So it's, it's a kind of special version of SQL Server, specially configured for one purpose only, uh, two purposes actually, to apply pages from log service uh, to the data file in its local RPPX cache and to serve pages to compute. So uh, because it's SQL Server, it, it has buffer pools, so it has a data cache in memory, which means that if you're reading a page, if, if a query uh, running on compute needs a page from a page server, it may not even need to do any kind of read from local RPPX on, on a page server. That page may be just found in the buffer pool already. So that's a performance optimization. There is a cover in RBPX cache. So RBPX stands for uh, Resilient Buffer Pool Extensions. And uh, <clears throat> that's basically a covering cache for the blob that sits in Azure Storage. So each blob is typically 128 gigabytes. And there is a covering, which means uh, covering cache, which means that there is that the size of this RBPX cache is also 128 gigabytes. All pages are cached in local SSD on the page server. So, even though reading data from a page server is a remote read, it's, it's a fast remote read because data is on local SSD or, as I said, in, in buffer pool. Uh, one role of the page server is to offload operations from compute. So things like checkpoint or writing changed pages to back to data files in blob storage is done by a page server, not compute. That means there is more uh, resource, uh, resources available for your workloads. Uh, backups. Backups are done via file snapshots in blob storage. And that's also something that is initiated by a page server. Now, uh, as far as uh, data redundancy and the data durability, that's provided by Azure Storage. Azure Storage has a very high uh, durability SLA, 11 nines over, over a year. So there is very a small chance of uh, data loss. Right. Now let's move on and talk about log service. And we'll do it from the perspective of the primary compute first. So on the primary compute, you may have a transaction that generated a log block, transaction log block. Um, that log block uh, is committed to something we call log landing zone. And log landing zone is uh, a page block in Azure premium storage. So we use premium storage for performance reasons. And uh, this is basically what provides durability for committed data. So a transaction on compute is not uh, uh, does not commit until we, we get an acknowledgement from this uh, log landing zone that the data has been hardened and is durable. So as we write uh, log blocks to uh, landing zone, there is an asynchronous process that uh, copies them to something called long-term storage, which is Azure standard storage. Uh, and that's basically what provides the infinite log abstraction uh, in hyperscale. So even though the size of the landing zone is finite, it's about one terabyte, you can actually keep writing log for, as, as, as you can keep writing as much log as, as you want, because all of that log will be uh, destaged and stored in the long-term storage uh, for the duration of uh, uh, backup retention of the database. So we can always use that log to uh, restore a copy of the database and bring it to a specified uh, point in time. Now, uh, as uh, a log block is getting uh, hardened in uh, uh, landing zone, it's also asynchronously sent to something they called X log process, right? That's, uh, that's a process, it's, it's, a, it's another uh, service fabric uh, application that runs in log service node. It does not run SQL Server, it's brand new uh, code. And uh, uh, it receives log blocks, it puts them in staging area in memory, and then it hashes them by page ID. And then those hashed log buffers are stored in memory as well. Uh, so some amount of them, the most recently uh, generated ones will be in memory and uh, the remainder, some the older log blocks will be cached on the local SSD cache of the log service. So that's, that's cache is larger than the amount of memory. So 
this way we can store more log blocks locally. So at this point, uh, we can have log blocks in four places, in the landing zone, in long-term storage, in memory, and on local SSD cache of the log service node. So what happens when we need that log, right? So uh, page servers and the secondary computer replicas continuously talk to uh, log service to get new log blocks, right? So, but the thing is, uh, not every log block has to be sent everywhere. So because they're hashed by page ID, each page server can only request log blocks for its own range of pages, right? And the same goes for replicas. So that's an optimization. Now, uh, each log block can be served from memory, from log broker, or it can be served, if, if it's not found in memory, it can be served from local SSD cache, or it can be served from either landing zone or standard storage, long-term storage. All right, let's look at the page read lifecycle. And we'll do that starting from the blob storage. So you have uh, a blob in blob storage, it's attached to a page server. Okay, so normally uh, the RBPX cache on the page server will be populated with the same data as in the blob. However, there are situations when that's not the case and that uh, page server needs to be seeded. For example, uh, if you are creating a copy of the hyperscale database, its page servers will be initially empty and they need to be seeded. So uh, if when we talk about the life cycle of a page, we, we should mention the possibility of having to seed uh, a page server, page, page servers RPTX cache. Then uh, let's say there is a query running on primary, primary or secondary compute, okay? So uh, that query may need uh, some pages and those pages can be spread between the buffer pool on the primary, on the compute, uh, RBPX cache on the compute or the page server. So if uh, we get the page we need from uh, local RBPX cache on compute, that's called the page hit. And it uh, returns fairly quickly in one to two milliseconds. It's a quick read. Now, if, uh, if that, uh, data is not found in either buffer pool or RBPX cache. Then we have to actually go to the page server. Now, uh, the, the trick here is that we, we don't just need that page from a page server. We need that page at a particular LSN. LSN stands for log sequence number. So it, we need a particular version of that page that would uh, make the data via region transactionally consistent. So uh, if that page already exists at that or higher LSN on the page server, we just return. However, if uh, if that, that, that version of the page is not yet on page servers, then we have to request log from log service and wait until that log gets redone or replayed uh, to the page server. And as that, that redo uh, happens, you will see page AOH uh, wait type on compute. All right, next topic is uh, log throttling service. So first question is why, why do we need to throttle? Right, that's probably, something that comes to mind when hearing the word throttling. So it's actually a very important part of any distributed system. And it's important because it lets the system to remain stable and balanced. So if any one component, a page server, a replica gets behind in applying log, we basically reduce log rate generation on the primary compute, we throttle it and let, we let that component catch up. The throttling service runs alongside of SQL Server uh, on compute node. It's a separate uh, executable, separate service. It talks to log service uh, periodically. It gets uh, actor progress. When we say actor, we mean any component, a page server, a replica, and so on and so forth. So it, it gets uh, actor log progress in applying log. And uh, if we see that, uh, a particular actor is less than one gigabyte behind in applying logs, there is no throttling at all. If it's more than giga, one gigabyte behind, then we start throttling in steps. And the, the initial step is fairly minimal. Uh, you still get uh, log generation close to 100 megabyte per second. But then if the actor uh, does not catch up, then the deeper throttling will be, uh, will be needed. OK, uh, how do you know that throttling is occurring, right? So you will see a number of RBIO weights. So you can see what they are here. Uh, there are five of them. And depending on the nature of the throttling, um, where it's coming from, you will see either RBIO RG storage, that's a page server getting behind, or RG stage, that's when uh, the staging log to the long-term storage is slow, 
for some reason, or a replica, which means a replica is slow applying log or local this stage that's copying log blocks to local cache in log service, or geo replica, geo replica is slow. So uh, it's not common, common, uh, but it, you do you do see sometimes uh, workloads that uh, occasionally may run into throttle. All right, let's now talk about hyperscale secondaries. So we call any replica other than the primary a secondary replica, and that includes uh, HA high availability replicas uh, and name replicas within the same region as the primary. So uh, we talked about HA replicas already. They are failover targets. You get higher SLA when there are more HA replicas. Uh, they are priced uh, with a discount compared to the primary. And they can also serve double duty as uh, readable uh, for, for readable uh, scale out, read scale out. Um, named replicas in, are in some way similar, but uh, there are some important differences, and we'll, we'll talk about that next. And one important thing about either HA or named replicas is that they use the same copy of the data as the primary. You can see on this uh, picture that there is just one set of page servers here and one log service. Now, if we talk about cross-region replicas, uh, that's geo replicas, and they're mostly used for uh, DR, just recovery. Uh, they may also be used for geographic read scale out. And in, they, they have their own copy of data because obviously for uh, just recovery, you, you need a separate copy of data in a different region. Now, for, <clears throat> for all replicas, uh, one important note to make is that log is applied to replicas asynchronously. That means that for any replica, we'll have some data latency uh, greater than zero compared to the primary. So if you have a workload that uh, needs uh, zero data latency at all times, in other words, you, you need to be able to read change data immediately, then you should run that workload on the primary. Replicas are for those workloads that can tolerate some data latency. It's usually minimal in the order of maybe tens of milliseconds, maybe low hundreds of milliseconds, uh, but it's there. So if you have a workload that cannot tolerate latency, uh, you should run it in the plan. But one important thing is, uh, is that any data you read from a replica is always transactionally consistent. So uh, until you've committed a transaction on the primary, you will not see the changes of the transaction on the secondary. Okay, uh, so on the replica, the, the, the data that we cache in RBPX is actually specific to queries executed there. So there is no synchronization between RBPX caches on the primary and on the secondaries. So the caches are specific to the workload running on each replica. Uh, one other point re regarding replicas is that uh, you can customize next up uh, separately for the primary and for the secondaries. There is a command, alter database code configuration. You actually run this on the primary, but you specify for secondary in the command. Okay, let's spend some time looking at named replicas. So that's just still a feature in public preview. Uh, it's supported for production workloads, uh, but it's not yet generally available. So uh, each named replica appears as a, as a separate read-only database with the same data as the primary, right? So, uh, and what, what I mean by separate is that you can scale each named replica separately. So you can have the primary say with two uh, vCores, and the secondary is 80 course or some other combination, right? So your writable workload may be more or less intensive than your read workload. So it may be necessary to scale them independently. Another uh, distinguishing feature of named replicas is that they may be hosted on the same logical server as the primary or a different logical server in the same region. Uh, so what does this provide is uh, the ability to have uh, different authentication for the primary versus um, a replica. That's actually a feature that many of our customers have asked for because, for example, um, they may want to create uh, a login that lets somebody see uh, read only data but uh, not being able to run any kind of resource intensive query on the primary and affect production. So that's what you can get this named replicas. You can have up to 30 of them uh, for one primary. So that lets you. Uh, uh, that enables workload isolation for different read-only workloads. For example, you may run some Power BI reporting on one named replica, run some data science workloads on another, and run some ad hoc uh, queries by users on yet another replica. Uh, creating named replicas is fairly simple. You can do it with PowerShell, RCLI, REST API. 
or in this case, uh, at SQL. So you basically say at secondary, you specify the server, you specify the service objective, which may be again different from the primary. Uh, secondary type is named, uh, and uh, the reason they call it named is because you can give a different name uh, to, to the database than the name of the primary. One thing that you uh, cannot yet do with named replicas is have some kind of load balancing across um, multiple replicas. However, we published a sam sample, a code sample that you can use uh, for that purpose to basically build your own uh, load balancing solution. Okay. Let's talk about <clears throat> recent feature improvements in hyperscale. So uh, one of them is called the backup storage redundancy. So just to explain what this is. Uh, by default, when you create an, a hyperscale database, the blobs uh, that stored in blob storage are stored in an array GRS storage account. That type of storage account uh, does geo-replication between regions. So any data is automatically replicate, replicated from the primary region to a paired region. Uh, and that's actually a great data protection feature because if some kind of a major outage were to happen in the primary region and your database becomes unavailable, there uh, you could still restore it from the data stored in the paired region. So <clears throat> that sounds great. And that's actually something we recommend for most customers. However, there are some customer scenarios where uh, the paired region is actually located in a different country or a different geography. And for compliance reasons, uh, customers cannot have any of their data geo-replicated outside of their country or their, geogra of their geography. So in that case, uh, when you create a new hyperscale database, you can actually uh, change uh, storage redundancy to be locally redundant or zone redundant in the same region. So then the data stays in the region. Okay, but again, uh, we, we usually recommend for most customers to use RAGRS, geo-redundant storage for data protection reasons. Uh, database copy in hyperscale is generally available now. Uh, so what it does, it creates a transactionally consistent copy of the source database. Uh, and if that copy is within the region, that's actually very fast, regardless of size of data. So uh, that enables scenarios such as like daily copying or nightly copying of uh, production database into lower environments for some uh, dev test activities. Uh, database copy has no impact on the source database because it's done at the storage level. Uh, as I mentioned, copies can be within the region or across the region, and you can also copy database across subscriptions or across tenants with TCO. Um, so you, if you can, if you can see this chart, uh, you'll see that uh, in this case, a nine terabyte uh, database was copied within the region of SDS2 in 12 minutes. Right, so that's uh, quite fast for the size. Uh, now that same database was copied across regions in 133 minutes, or uh, copied within the region, but uh, as as a geo replica uh, in about 125 minutes. So. One thing to note is that even though uh, you may be running a copy across regions, it's not really proportional to size of data. So if this was an 18 terabyte database, it would still probably take maybe a little bit longer than 133 minutes, but not twice that amount of time. And that's because uh, we, we copy all the blobs uh, that the database uses in parallel, right? So it's not sequential, so uh, it's not sequential copies. So the time is not proportional to size of data, even this uh, database copy across regions. So yet another recent uh, improvement that is now generally available is um, uh, customer managed keys with transport transparent data encryption, also known as BYOK or bring your own key. So uh, that works just the same as in other Azure SQL tiers. So you can basically encrypt your database using your own key stored in Azure Key Vault. Uh, so you can read more about that in the uh, blog that we've published. All right, our next topic is roadmap. So we'll talk about things that we are currently working on and that will be uh, coming uh, uh, to uh, preview or general availability in the, in the next few months. So geo-replication in hyperscale is already in public preview. Uh, it's there with some limitations, and one of those limitations is lack of support for failover groups. 
So we will be adding that uh, fairly soon. Uh, so you, you'll be able to use failover groups with hyperscale just like you can uh, with other uh, SQL tiers. Another very common uh, customer request is to provide uh, restorability for uh, periods longer than seven days. So that's also coming soon, hopefully before the end of this calendar year. Zone redundancy is another improvement that we're working on. So that will basically let you uh, make a hyperscale database resilient to uh, zonal outages, right? So that's already available for business critical and premium. It's in preview for general purpose, and we're working on this for hyperscale. And then last but not least, uh, today when you create a hyperscale database, you actually have to check a tick box uh, saying that uh, you won't be able to um, to switch the service tier back from hyperscale to some other tier. Uh, and that uh, gave some of our customers uh, some pause hesitation adopting hyperscale, migrating to hyperscale, because they wanted to have that ability to switch back uh, to, uh, to the current to their current service tier if for any reason hyperscale didn't work for them. So we are adding that capability uh, from hyperscale to general purpose. Uh, once a database is migrated to general purpose, you can then move it to any other tier as well. So even if you use business critical today, you can still go to hyperscale and then migrate back. It's just an extra stop in general purpose. There is uh, one fairly obvious caveat is that the size of the database has to be within uh, maximum data limit of the general purpose database for this to work. Okay, so let's talk about some performance problems that we are solving. Um, so those are not common, but they do affect some of our customers and uh, we, we are actually have done a fairly substantial amount of work uh, to address this. So uh, just to explain what those problems are. So today in hyperscale, the size of the blob in blob storage equals to the maximum size of data file in the database. So if you query sys.database files view, you will see the maximum sizes of files. And those match the blob sizes in blob storage. Uh, we support two maximum file sizes, 128 gigabytes, which are used for most uh, files, uh, most hyperscale databases, or uh, one terabyte. And those are used when you migrate uh, a larger database from say, uh, business critical or premium or standard or general purpose to hyperscale. Right, so one terabyte uh, blobs are not common, but they do exist. Uh, why is it a problem? It's because uh, when, when the workload has many small writes, some kind of a highly intensive transaction workload, for example, uh, the writes that happen on page servers, uh, the writes to blobs can actually hit uh, the IOPS limit of the blob, right? Because that limit is the same in our standard, standard storage, storage, regardless of uh, uh, regardless of blob size. Right. So particularly for one terabyte blobs, because if they store so much data, the amount of IO against uh, the one terabyte of data will be particularly large. So that problem can happen. And if, uh, if that happens, uh, you can run into uh, storage throttling in the storage set. Another similar problem is that some kind of a blip in storage performance or availability can slow down or, or even sometimes uh, stop writes from page server to the blob, right? So <clears throat> that's clearly a problem. And in both of those cases, what happens is that when uh, blob IO slows down, redo on the page server slows down as well, right? So new pages are not getting applied uh, to uh, RBPX cache or to buffer pool on the page server fast enough. So any kind of read from the page, ser from the page server uh, must wait for log apply. And that manifests itself as page IO latch on compute. So it basically looks as if uh, storage is very slow, right? which it is in this case. Uh, another uh, manifestation of this is that you can actually see low grade throttling if, uh, if a page server gets behind uh, by more than one gigabyte because of this, uh, the, rate, the low grade will be throttled. And then in that case, you will see those RBIO weights. Okay. Uh, yet another problem that we are solving is that, uh, and that's more in, less common, but more insidious problem, is that a page blob will be fragmented with many small writes. So when you are reading from that blob, it's actually the reads will be much slower. And that affects operations such as RBPX seeding on page servers or GeoRestore or anything that needs to read uh, data uh, from, from the blob in blob storage. 
so uh, for both of these problems, we have two solutions. They're in private preview right now. Uh, we call them right behind and storage V2. So let's take a closer look at what those are. So right behind basically avoids small writes Azure storage block. So this current behavior, when we do a checkpoint on page server, uh, we do IO concurrently against uh, local RPPX and Azure storage. So every page is written in both places at the same time, about the same time. Uh, so the change is that uh, we are actually eliminating that concurrent write. Instead of uh, writing to uh, Azure storage continuously, we instead use larger but less frequent writes. So we maintain a dirty page bitmap uh, on the page server. Uh, right behind checkpoints, scan that bitmap, and it identifies pages that need to be written out to blob storage and write them in larger chunks. So as a result, the number of IOPS against uh, the blob storage blob uh, is much reduced. Now, you may be wondering how, how does it impact uh, data durability because we are now not writing data, not writing out data to blob storage as often. Uh, so that's true, but that's okay because remember that we are still maintaining uh, all the transaction log generated. So that just means that during recovery, we may have to spend a few extra seconds uh, replaying the log to bring the database uh, to the transaction consistent point. Okay. <laughs> so uh, storage V2. So, what this does is it actually decouples logical data files that you see in the databases, the database files, um, and actual blobs in Azure Storage. So for each data file, instead of having just one blob, they actually have many, and a lot, I would say. A lot of smaller blobs, and with multiple smaller blobs, uh, the per blob IO limit does not change, but the amount of IO against each blob is much less. So you no longer see the same kind of uh, storage throttling issues that you might see this current approach where there is just one file per block. And that's what solves uh, the problems with uh, larger one terabyte page servers or larger databases. So if we want to take a closer look at storage V2, uh, you can see that on this picture, uh, you have a file, uh, let's say MDF or NDF file in the database. That file is actually split into multiple slices, 128 gigabyte slices, right? Each slice consists of what we call cells. A cell is 16 gigabytes, and a cell uh, in turn consists of four stripes. There is a lot of new terminology here, I realize. Uh, so a stripe is actually a blob in our storage, right? So you can see that instead of just one blob, uh, in this case, uh, for 128 gigabytes, we will have dozens of stripes. Uh, they will be much smaller, and yet each one of them will still provide the same amount of IOPS as a single uh, blob we would use otherwise. Okay, so uh, it's now time for another demo. Uh, so what we'll show in this case uh, is a TPCC-like workload uh, using uh, HammerDB, right? Uh, with and without uh, those two improvements, right behind the storage video. So a few words about HammerDB and, and the workload it generates. So it basically simulates a workload uh, in some kind of online ordering application. So uh, you have uh, stock in a number of warehouses and customers place orders against that stock. Right, so it's fairly typical. Um, when, when you populate the database, uh, you actually set the number of warehouses you want to use. So in this case, we use the maximum uh, 5,000 warehouses. So it's a fairly large database, about 500 gigabytes, right? Now, one other kind of distinguishing feature of this workload is that it's very write intensive. Right? So it's uh, at least 50% writes, and, and the writes are such that the same page uh, may be modified by many different sessions a lot of times. So uh, that actually creates uh, a very challenging workload for a distributed database. Uh, so let's see how, how this actually looks uh, before and after. So one other thing I want to mention is that uh, we are actually running this in a pre-production environment, right? So some surprises are with this demo are possible. Uh, hopefully this will not happen, but just bear with us if it does. Okay. So here I have two copies of HammerDB running side by side and this one. On the left is uh, without the improvements that I mentioned, uh, 
right behind that storage V2. And the one on the right is with those two improvements. And you can see right away, just looking at this, that uh, there is a substantial difference in throughput, right? Um, if we take a closer look at um, Grafana dashboard for uh, the first database, uh, the one without the improvements, you can actually see that uh, it's not looking that great. You can see this uh, long uh, period without any activity. You can see that CPU, even after activity has resumed, is quite spiky. And uh, log, right, is similarly spiky. And if you look at throughput, you also see that the average is among the 300 uh, batch requests per second. Let's compare it against the new database. So here we have a much better picture. So uh, we see a healthy 30% CPU utilization, uh, some log rate uh, generation, and batch requests per second are actually at 1600, so several times higher than what we saw. Um, and if we compare uh, the weights uh, on, on the previous database versus this, you can see that most of the time is actually spent on page AOLH. So that's one of those cases when uh, when we see throttling in the storage, uh, in our storage, and that results in very low throughput on the database sites because of storage weights. Now, if you compare it uh, against weights on the new database, you, you can still see some page large weights, but the important point is that they're much more even without uh, dips and spikes. Uh, and in fact, uh, the next, the second uh, weight is right log and not page large. So, in other words, storage performance is actually significantly better in this case. Now, I will mention that uh, in, in this 16 core database, uh, the, the workload uh, is actually, the, the database is actually somewhat undersized for the type of workload it's running. We, we intentionally uh, did this demo in such a way to kind of demonstrate the problem, uh, but uh, normally you would have a, a larger database for this kind of workload and, and not a day, not a database with a larger amount of memory. 83 gigabytes of memory for a uh, 500 gigabyte database is somewhat low. Okay, um, moving on. So uh, some other improvements uh, we are making are around uh, transaction commit latency, right? So you, you saw that write log weight, that's basically the, the weight associated with writing to log landing zone. That, that landing zone is in remote storage, so there is some network latency involved. Uh, so we are working on an improvement to uh, minimize transaction commit latency and actually bring it uh, down to the times you would typically see on business critical and premium tiers. Uh, another improvement, actually multiple improvements, is in uh, secondary redo. So that just improves read scale experience to uh, improve performance, uh, reduce data latency on replicas, and so on. Uh, yet another improvement is uh, something called compute RPX priming, right? So today when uh, the primary or secondary replica is uh, failing over, or when you scale it to a higher or lower number of cores, the local compute RPX cache is lost, right? And it has to be rehydrated with the workload again. So with this improvement, we will actually uh, prime it uh, as a part of the failover, we will keep track of hot pages, and then after failover, we will uh, proactively populate that RVPX cache with those hot pages. Okay, so next, uh, let's just talk about some performance and scale tips for hyperscale, right? Uh, now, the, the number one, and it's not even specific to hyperscale, is that hyperscale still uses the same database engine as uh, SQL Server, as Azure SQL database. So all the common best practices that you have for uh, design or tuning or optimization, uh, they still apply, right? So in fact, when we work with customers uh, using hyperscale, about 80% of uh, problems we solve or help them solve are not hyperscale specific at all. They're just general SQL uh, problems, either suboptimal design or some kind of query tuning or missing index, uh, that really doesn't change. Now, going into uh, some something more hyperscale specific uh, in terms of index maintenance, it's uh, kind of more relevant for hyperscale because databases tend to be larger in general. So the first uh, tip here is evaluate whether you actually need to do index maintenance. We still very often see customers uh, do that just out of habit or because they've been doing it uh, for many years uh, on-prem environments, but 
very often that actually does not result in any kind of improvement. Instead, uh, customers just uh, waste time and resources on it. In fact, sometimes customers have to scale up their databases uh, just to get the necessary resources to run uh, index maintenance. So we've recently published uh, updated documentation for uh, index maintenance. You can just search, uh, do the web search for uh, SQL index maintenance. You'll find that uh, help topic. And we present some strategy for determining whether you need index maintenance and how to do it if you do. Uh, so if you do run, if, if you do have to create or rebuild indexes, use resumable iterations. That's particularly relevant for larger databases because uh, any kind of index operation on, on a large index uh, will take time and the likelihood of something uh, either on the client side or on the server side, uh, failing during that long operation gets higher. So it's resumable. Uh, you don't have to lose work that you've done so far. You can just resume that uh, index operation if it became stopped for any reason. Uh, if you're running indexes uh, offline, uh, use MaxDAP uh, because that's particularly important if uh, you set MaxDAP to some lower value uh, for the rest of your database. Uh, but you need to create an index as fast as possible, right? Because then you will see a no noticeable improvement in index creation speed if you set next up to say eight or 12 or sometimes even 16, uh, even if your uh, next up for the database is set to some lower number, maybe four or even one. Um, so just be aware of that. Now, one, one problem that customers sometimes see, and it's not really hyperscale specific, you may see it on any Azure SQL database or any SQL Server database. It's time to be contention, right? So that's particularly uh, common workloads that use a lot of temp tables uh, and create and drop them very frequently. Uh, so and and one of the solutions for the problem is to use memory optimized table variants. Now, it so happens that in hyperscale we don't yet support uh, in-memory OTP, right? which means you you cannot really create a memory optimized table in the database. However, you we do support memory optimized table variables as well as uh, natively compiled stored procedures. So memory LTP is actually partially supported in hyperscale. So, and that's one good usage of it is to use memory optimized table variab variables to uh, reduce them to be contention. Next is uh, a few topics uh, for mostly DW analytical workloads that have to ingest uh, a lot of data. So uh, one trait of hyperscale is that we support uh, the same uh, highest 100 MB per, per second log rate, uh, irrespective of compute size. So even with two cores, you can, in principle, uh, generate 100 megabytes of logs per second. Now, the, the caveat here is if, if you have a small database with just a couple of cores, two cores, four cores, it may be difficult uh, to generate that much log, right? just because you don't have enough CPU power on the primary, right? So if you're in that situation, if you do need to ingest fast uh, and you're not seeing 100 megabyte per second log rate, it could be because your CPU is uh, at 100% and you just can't really uh, generate that log. So you may need to scale up in that case. Uh, one very common tip is, uh, for improving load throughput is use data compression, either column store or page compression. That's because more data will basically fit into uh, unit time, um, so uh, consider that. And then, if you do need to ingest large amounts of data, make sure to use some. Make sure to use some uh, bulk API. We, we still see customers sometimes using uh, single time inserts uh, or maybe batched inserts, and that's not nearly as efficient as using some kind of a uh, bulk uh, uh, API, such as what provided by Azure Data Factory or Spark or just in .NET SQL bulk copy uh, class. And finally, uh, even though a hyperscale database is virtually limitless in terms of its size, uh, keep in mind that TempDB is still uh, finite. It's stored on local SSD, right? So local SSD is finite. There is only so much disk space there. Uh, so TempDB uh, is also finite. So if you run into a problem with running out of TempDB space, uh, you may need to scale up to get more TempDB space because it's proportional to the number of cores. Uh, or you may have to just optimize the workload to not use as much TempDB. OK, so at this point, uh, I'm going to hand it off back to Sanjay to talk about 
um, hyperscale customers and workloads that we are seeing. So, Jim, stop sharing. Okay. So, go ahead and. Thank you, Dimitri. Okay, uh, you stop sharing. Okay, let me share my screen there. And we will spend some time at the end of the session on questions. I do see uh, that there are some questions here, so we'll, we'll definitely address those. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. And can you see the right screen? Uh, you're still on the tip slide, slide, so just- Different slide though. Right? Next slide. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here okay. I go. Good, good. Okay, so uh, so thank you, Dimitri, for for walking through the the depths of of, of hyperscale. And now the audience, now that you have seen a nice slick uh, database, you would like to know who's using it and how they're using it and why they're they're, they're using it. And so I'll walk through some examples, some customer scenarios where people build them um, uh, using hyperscale, and then how how and why. And we are seeing that some uh, interesting patterns are emerging is because hyperscale is relatively new, um, uh, even though it has been like a GA for two plus years now. So it's a pretty solid. It is gaining grounds in many different uh, industries and many different workloads. Uh, and we are seeing that what type of workloads are coming towards, towards hyperscale. Uh, what we're seeing is that uh, many customers who are building new cloud born applications and they're trying to future-proof scaling for space and compute. Uh, they do not know how big the database could become. They do not know how much of compute they need. They really do not know if the, how the ratio of compute to their storage will be. So they want to pick a database service where the compute and storage scale independently. And some examples, and they really do not know how big the database could become. So they do want to be ready for the big databases. One great example we got to know during the COVID time. When the COVID started uh, impacting uh, many countries, uh, many countries started to build a COVID database on who all are, are impacted, how, how they're being treated, what all research is happening, uh, vaccination data, et cetera. They started gathering lots of data. So when they started to build these databases, they really do not know how many people will be they need to track. They also did not really know how many people will be impacted to heart level, what all different types of data they need to need to collect and capture. And therefore they future proof. Many countries, central health organizations, I'm not able to take the names here because we don't have a public case study with them, but many big countries, the names that come to your mind uh, actually used, uh, they built a COVID based applications on SQL DB hyperscale. And it served them very well because they, they, as the uh, months of COVID infection progressed, they got to know that they need to collect more and more and more data and none of them run into any kind of space problem or size limitation problems with hyperscale. So that's one pattern that, that, that we saw. Another pattern that we saw was the patterns that require independent scaling of space and compute. Uh, those workloads where uh, you could expect that this, either space could grow fast and compute could be, uh, could be cyclical, it could be seasonal, and therefore they want to, don't want to tie them together. In some other tiers, uh, you have seen that the amount of storage you get with your database is a function of the amount of vCores you, you provision for that database and not in, not in SQL hyperscale. You could have a uh, multi terabyte database on two cores. You could have a one GB database with 80 cores. You could have all kinds of combinations possible. And those were towards adhered towards, uh, towards hyperscale. Then we saw um, the workloads that want to take advantage of fast compute scaling. Uh, as you saw the architecture when um, Dimitri described, in hyperscale, the storage and compute are, are uh, decoupled. They're decoupled with multiple layers of caching in between them, which means is that you can scale uh, the compute very fast. And scaling compute is not a size of data operation. You could go from two, uh, um, uh, two core to 80 cores in a matter of, on an average, a minute. And if even if you may have 80 terabyte database going from a two core to 80 core is super, super fast. Same thing going, going down. Uh, 
not possible with database tiers which are uh, where the storage and computer type to type together and therefore many workloads uh, where these kind of uh, need existed where they would say that okay you know my database size is big but during the daytime i need 20 cores during the nighttime i need only two cores and then or i have much more cyclic during the morning i need 80 cores during the late afternoon i need 80 cores but in between i need only 10 cores or in the night i need only 20 cores all these kind of stuff people people did all these kind of a um, combinations uh, were much much easily doable because scaling compute is extremely fast um, the other kind of workload that we saw that um, uh, customer who need scaling of read and write independently, for example, IoT applications. IoT applications, you always have uh, writes coming in. And then you know that you may be reading those IoT data that you have gathered uh, to gain some kind of a uh, pattern about the data, to understand any anomalies or with the data, to understand any kind of a pattern with the, with the data. And so you may be running a lot of queries on the data. And you may be doing uh, using uh, a lot more uh query nodes compared to uh, uh, to to write nodes and uh, we have seen in some uh, iot applications you can actually use a single write node to insert millions of rows per second and therefore one node for write for iot applications scales extremely well uh, but for for reading for different types of query you could actually spin up multiple replicas you could spin up actually multiple ha replicas and do query on them you could actually spin up now we have named replicas also on um, uh, on, on public preview now and you could actually spin up multiple uh, named replicas and then and, and offload uh, query to them offloading query to named replica had tons of advantages in the sense that if your uh, primary which is your right node it could be 70 it could be 60 core 50 core 40 cores whatever right you could have a different number of cores for your named replica you could have different number of cores for each of your name replicas. Uh, and you could actually connect to a given name replica directly to a specific replica. So all those advantages makes uh, this type of workload uh, choosing uh, hyperscale like a no-brainer. Uh, ISV application modernizing to SaaS. Uh, when ISV application, uh, typical ISV provider used, will, they sell licenses of their software. When they licenses of their software, they usually uh, other customer, their customers will kind of install that and then they do, which means that the control of that software and the control of the data produced by their software is with the customer, the responsibility is with the customer. The moment the ISVs become a SaaS provider, they now need to ensure that they manage that data efficiently. Uh, they manage that data in a way that um, they provide the right amount of isolation, right amount of granularity, right amount of cost optimization, right amount of scaling uh, for, for those. So therefore, the SaaS program now will have to decide what type of database tier they choose uh, for their ISV application. Now, many ISV applicants, they actually don't know whether when, once they release their SaaS, whether it will be adopted by 100 users or by 100,000 users. It could go like, um, uh, viral and suddenly they have hundreds of thousands of users and to to uh, be able to provide service to them they need a database that can scale both size wise and compute wise and, and and without having to bother about choosing something else once they have their their saas application has become very popular so they, they have chosen um, hyperscale in those situations that we have seen uh, we also see a tons of a large SQL Server databases migrating from on-prem to other or from other clouds. Uh, when you have, uh, typically when you are migrating a smaller database, you have many options. You can go to uh, VM, you can go to a manage instance, you can go to business critical or, or general purpose tier. But if you're, if you're migrating a 20 terabyte database, that was your business critical database. or that was your main application database on-prem. Uh, then the, the, the possible target that you have is actually hyperscale. And we have seen many such large databases uh, actually migrated from uh, on-prem on to cloud. One such example is a very big uh, shipping company, uh, shipping slash courier company. And then they were running, every time they ship something, they, they and their users will be tracking those shipments. 
And to be able to track those shipments, their, their database was like 30 terabyte plus, and they were running on on-prem SQL Server, and they migrated to hyperscale on um, SQL DB hyperscale, so that they can actually take care of the 30 terabyte in, in the cloud. Uh, same thing applies for a very popular um, uh, coffee retailer in the in the world. Almost every country has a coffee shop from from this company, and when you go buy coffee in this company and then you pay through your phone or pay through a, a gift card, uh, that data is actually tracked using, it was being used in SQL Server on-prem, now it is being tracked using a Azure SQL DB hyperscale uh, because that data is huge. That's like 50, 60 ter terabytes of data. You can imagine uh, people buying coffee all over the world. So these are the kind of applications that we see coming in. And also we see uh, SMP, SMP is actually symmetric multiprocessing. That means that one node uh, is 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 the your compute is, is one node and you can have multiple nodes, but um, it's not a scale out uh, data warehouse like SQL data warehouse or Synapse. Uh, so people who are running SQL Server as a data warehouse on premises or people who want a similar data warehouse or a data mart in the cloud, uh, they're all coming uh, to Azure SQL hyperscale uh, because SMP has certain properties and these data these application need those properties. Um, those people who need uh, an MPP type of data warehouse, uh, multi, uh, which is massively parallel processing, which is like a scale out data warehouse like Synapse or SQL DW. Um, so uh, let's take some uh, stories, some, some real stories is um, uh, Snyder Electric and all the names that I'm showing here, we actually have a public case study with them. So uh, you can actually go and search for them, read for them on internet and you'll know the full story, what, 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 what do they do? Uh, Sonata Electric is, is, is a very popular company, well-known company. They have actually IoT workload running on, on SQL hyperscale. Uh, there is another similar company uh, who actually have a, a very big IoT workload and that is actually monitoring the operational data from wind uh, turbines. The, the wind turbines uh, are, they have wind turbines all over the world. They collect tons of data from these wind turbines and that data comes into a single uh, hyperscale database in, in, in Azure. And that database has become like 60, 70 ter terabytes already now. Uh, very interesting is actually the high res Studio, which is actually a gaming company. They produce video games. And uh, many of you may already may have used some of the, 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 the video games. And, and that is running on, on Azure SQL DB hyperscale. Uh, Clearant is actually a financial processing company. They do the payment processing. And that payment processing is, is, is run on SQL DB, DB hyperscale. Uh, BMI is a very interesting workload. Uh, if, you, if you listen to a music on some of those music providers on the web or on the phone today, like let's say Spotify, if you use um, uh, listen to music there, ultimately that uh, the music producer, the artist, uh, all those they need to be paid the royalty. So BMI is actually aggregates all the data that comes from Spotify and similar other consume, uh, consumption platforms, and they they collect and calculate how much uh, uh, how much royalty should be paid to the to the uh, to the producer to the to the uh, to the artist and etc. Uh, and then there is a bunch of um, other applicants too. Uh, Big Red Cloud. Big Red Cloud is actually a ISV based in, in Ireland and they create accounting software for individuals and for businesses. Uh, so they converted themselves into a SaaS business and they, they choose Hyperscale because they are ready for hyper growth uh, for, their, for their SaaS app. Uh, ClearSell also works in the financial uh, business. What they do is actually um, uh, fraud detection and, and, and prevention for, for e-commerce applications. Their customers are actually e-commerce providers who actually uh, work with ClearSell to ensure that, that their transactions are, are, are fraud proof. And ClearSell uses uh, hyperscale SQL DB to, to do that. Quest Analytics works in the, in the healthcare space. Uh, the healthcare companies use use them for various type of analytics, and and another electronics company called called Avnet, and there are actually many more. 
you can go to uh, web search and actually search on these names and search on other names of customers who are actually using SQL Hyperscale today. And with 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 that, we are uh, coming close to to the to the to the end end of the session. We'll leave some time for Q and A. And so, thank you from 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 us. Uh, thank you from uh, uh, that Data Platform Summit. And and hope you have enjoyed our session. And looking forward to the, uh, the questions and answers. So, uh, Ruben was asking if. Uh... There are other applications, other uh, data iterations that will be offloaded to page service. And short answer is yes, uh, that's something we're working on, but uh, too early for details. Uh, and then another question is about automatic scaling in hyperscale. Is that something that's coming? Again, short answer is yes, <laughs> too early for details, but please stay tuned. Mm -hmm.